So ideas are plentiful. And great ideas are precious. But materializing these ideas, they require a lot of work. And usually ideas, the biggest challenge they face are follow through and execution. And ideas become more powerful when people get behind them and support them. So I'd like to share a little story with you today about a great idea that led to the creation of what is now the greatest digital library of Caribbean content in the world. And how it all started with just one idea. And this idea and what we call a community of practice, which is basically a community of people who have shared interests, and how they used collaboration to make it happen. So to give you a little context, and I'm going to take you a little bit back in time to 2004. The internet was kind of going through some revolutions in 2004. And uh, some of you may remember there was this thing called The Facebook, started by some guy named Mark Zuckerberg. And then that same year, there was a, a social media platform named MySpace. And that was sold for millions of dollars. And everybody was asking, what is that? Why? You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And then some company called Google announces this thing called Gmail, 2004. So if you think of our lives today with those companies and what they were thinking about and talking about, how different would today be? You know, There was a conversation happening in the Caribbean that same year at the Association of Caribbean Universities and Research Institutions and Libraries. They were having their 34th annual conference and it was taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. And amazingly, the conversation they were having was because they were talking about the challenges that they faced as libraries and as museums and as archives, but the challenges that researchers were facing doing their research and discovering content. So there was a huge need for researchers to be able to continue their work and push forward to have ways to get to this content, and in particular, this Caribbean content. So just to give you kind of like the why this idea and these conversations and why it should happen. And it's because I firmly believe that everyone deserves an effective education. Everyone should have the right to an engaging, accessible, informative content and resources to be able to improve themselves. And access to education and educational content should never be limited by geography, should never be limited by resources, by finances. And that's what technology is here and has done for many industries and many things over. So bearing that in mind and bearing what the researchers need and what the libraries and the museums and the archives, what these institutions need, they need a way to preserve their content first and foremost, because that's what they're in the business of. They're in the business of having content and preserving it first. But besides preserving that content, it's very important to make that content accessible. Because what good does it when you have something and you hoard it and you hide it and nobody even knows it's there, right? But that brings a little dilemma, that brings a little challenge. And the dilemma and the challenge with that is that if you don't let people know, then they don't know, they can't access it. And then the other challenge is, once, if you make this accessible, people come and touch it or, or get it. And I'm sure everybody here at one point or another has been to a museum or a gallery or a library and where there's something, there's an object and there's a rope or there's a document. And if you visit our Library of Congress and you go see the Declaration of Independence, that thing is so heavily guarded and these things because they're precious. It's our history. It's our cultural heritage. It's what tells the story about us. And it's what helps us look back to see where we're going in the future.
So they, there you could see where it's important that these things are preserved. So with these challenges about content being everywhere, all over the Caribbean and in the United States and all around the world, but it's not easily accessible because if you think about most researchers and most people who are looking for this content or doing research or even you, if you're looking for information on somewhere where you may want to go in the future to visit and travel, there's only so much you could find. But what if you could find everything you were looking for? What if there's that special something, you know, in an archive somewhere that if you just knew that existed, you would have not missed it. Like sometimes you go on a trip somewhere and you come back and somebody says, oh, so did you go to this place? And you're like, oh, I had no idea that was even there. I was right next to it. So this is what happens with that content. Researchers are, are always seeking for it. The other thing is that the content is also spread out geographically. There's a lot of different institutions, different places. So getting to these places requires resources. It requires being able to travel. It requires time and all of these things. Besides that, the content is also varied. It's documents, it's uh, sculptures, paintings, poetry, literature, audio recordings. It's all these different things you can imagine. And in trying to solve this problem with so many different kinds of content and institutions and needs, you also have another thing in there. Because you see, some people think about the Caribbean, they don't actually realize how varied the Caribbean is. How many languages are actually spoken in the Caribbean? I mean, there are so many languages, and there's, there's the French Caribbean, the Dutch Caribbean, there's the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, the English-speaking Caribbean, Papiamento, I mean, you name it. There's so many languages that are spoken in the Caribbean. But also there are governments and entities, and people run things a little bit differently. So these are challenges as far as not only this content and these shared things, but when it comes to language and communicating, so if I'm doing research on Dutch history in the Caribbean, those keywords and those terms are going to be a little bit different than what I'm used to searching for in English. So there's that translation challenge there. So bearing all of this in mind and all of the different styles of institutions and their needs, but with these shit similar uh, challenges, we knew that this platform had to be created, that it had to be online, and it had to be freely accessible. But we knew that it couldn't be done unless we had people collaborating, the libraries, the museums, the archives. So bearing that in mind, we came up with a model, we call it the DLOC model, where partner institutions agreed to share goals and practices. They agreed to support each other's joint uh, the efforts as far as their actions. So one of the other things was their procedures. The entire community that came together decided we need to follow a certain set of procedures and put in a, a shared governance model. So this platform that we're creating is not just three, three institutions that are starting this and putting all the rules. The rules are being made with the entire partnership collaboration of this community. And I'd be remiss if I don't mention some of these partners because it was really these nine founding partners that helped get this idea off the ground. And that was the National Archives of Haiti. There was the um, CARICOM, which is the uh, Caribbean Community Secretariat. There's La Fundación Global Democracia y Desarrollo, the National Library of Jamaica, the University of the Virgin Islands, La Universidad de Oriente in Venezuela, University of Central Florida, University of Florida, and Florida International University. These nine founding partners in the summer of 2004 decided to make it official and forge ahead with this plan. So a lot of development and planning uh, got them to this point. And once this planning committee decided that these were the rules that it had to be free online, accessible, and open, and shared in governance, they forged ahead. So between all the partners, they applied for a grant, and the US Department of Education actually funded this grant in 2005. And in 2005, 
is, um, is a pivotal year because that's, that's already been about a year in the planning and now there is actual resource to make this idea happen. A financial resource to put some of the preliminary things in place. So another year of planning goes by and it's, um, let's go here, there we go. And it's now April 2006, two years planning, two years talking about how we're gonna resolve this. So finally, the technological part of the platform is ready. And the partners put content on here and it's been two years in building this and talking about this and it goes live. And in April of 2006, the Digital Library of the Caribbean has 394 people who visit this thing. Now, it's kind of funny because you think about this, two years in the planning, nine institutions, hundreds of thousands of documents being put online and 394, so people are scratching their heads now and saying, oh boy, did we actually, you know, <laughs> this, is a, this is a little bit worrisome. But you see, the thing is that it wasn't just about this digital platform. This was about creating a community bringing a community together and leveraging each other's resources because the platform is only one part of this. The other part was we built this platform but now we have to train and teach people how to use the platform. And now we've got to go into our partners and our communities to help build capacity at these institutions. And that's how the power of collaboration and, and, and different communities of practice works. So one institution has a technological infrastructure. Another institution had um, experience with metadata and their librarians. Another institution had the archivists, the museum curators that can determine how we're going to make this happen. So little by little, everybody's leveraging each other's resources. So. With continued institutional support and a little bit of head scratching with only 394 people visiting, the community continues to forge and keep moving forward with this. And just a few years ago, I, I have to share two quick side stories with you because just a few years ago, we were, we were in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, training a group of partners in, in, in Haiti and something quite amazing happens that just shows you what the power of these communities when they come together, what happens, but why it happens this way. And it's the people in these communities. And we were doing a training workshop teaching how to digitize newspapers with a camera and copy stand. And this is one gentleman that was pretty new, just recently hired as his institution. His name is Wandre. And Wandre is one of my personal heroes in, in all of this story. And Wandre was just absorbing everything that was happening that day and getting a little bit of hands-on uh, along with those about 20 people that we were training. So we worked through the entire morning. We go off to lunch, but Wandre decides he wants to stay back. And he stays behind and he's like, no, I want to stay. I want to work with this a little bit. So an hour later, we all get back from lunch and it's just Wandre there and he's sitting down and we ask him, so what, what did you do? Wandre managed to digitize an entire week's worth of a newspaper collection by himself during the time that we were having lunch. And what's amazing about that, it's not that he was just one guy, but it was the motivation. And to give you context on this, these are not easy newspapers to digitize. These are newspapers that are fragile and delicate, that fall apart. So you have to handle them very carefully. You have to have that experience and have to remember all of the steps that you're being taught by all of these different experts of how to transfer this paper so it doesn't fall apart on you. So that's why these communities work. It's the people in these communities that have the drive and the motivation. There's another little story here and it's regarding another person in this community of practice, and this is a PhD candidate at Florida International University. His name is Adam Sylvia. So historians are notorious for wanting to work on their projects and on their research solo, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, 
they, it's a very small community as far as the interests of the areas they're working in. So most of the time, you know, the other folks are very spread across the globe that may have the same kind of interest on a particular area of history. So Adam's interest was in the political history of Haiti. And he was inspired because this digital library of the Caribbean platform, all of the content he was finding there for his research, he had this idea and he says, you know, how about if we take all of the content that's in there and I actually build something to contextualize it and build a teaching resource that anybody can access online. So what's amazing about this is that this one PhD candidate, which he's now graduated, now he's Dr. Sylvia, was able to garner the support and the energy and motivation of over 100 experts to contribute to this project that is now called Haiti and Island Luminous. What's amazing about this is that he brought 100 other experts out of their rooms and their private places to collaborate and work together online. So this resource is not only available in English, this resource is available in French and Creole completely. And if you want to learn the history of Haiti and you don't know where to start, you just Google this thing, Haiti, Island Luminous, history. And you have 4,000 years of how Haiti comes to be Haiti, right there. Teachers have access, students have access. An entire community of 104 experts came together to work on this one project. So just to kind of conclude on, on where we're going with this, and something I'm extremely proud of in this community and head scratching in 2006, you know, in December of 2016, we, and when I say we, I mean the 48 partners who are current contributors to this Digital Library of the Caribbean, to this idea, to this platform of sharing, of making educational accessible, of making resources um, easy to find. In December 2006, this one reason which we weren't sure if we had justification or was a good idea or not, we hit 102 million reasons and justifications on why this was a good idea. We average now over 3 million visits a month. And this is, when I tell you this, this is a library whose niche is Caribbean content. You're not going to find content here that's about any other place unless it has something to do with the Caribbean. So when you look at that and you look at the power of what the community has been able to do to create that one idea creates a unique open access collaborative platform that is freely accessible for anyone. You're not just solving the problems of the researchers. Now you're putting education in the hands of anybody who has access. And I'm working to also bridge that digital divide and that technological divide libraries are putting this content in on their computer systems so that people can access. So now, one collection becomes a giant collection put together by so many partners. And our model focused just not only on the community that had the interest, but it focused on the end user as well, on the casual user. So, Education is a fundamental necessity of human beings. And humanity gains the most from our collaborative efforts. And we see that every day with things. And I invite you to continue forward. And when you have that great idea, even though it may seem far-fetched, to reach out to your peers, to reach out to your communities of interest, because amazing things can happen. Thank you.